Hi everyone, it's John, owner and winemaker of Frog Sleep Winery. And he's here with Rory Williams, owner and winemaker of Frog Sleep Winery. <laughs> welcome back all those uh, who are joining us for another time and uh, welcome to all the new folks coming in. We got quite a few uh, new people this week. We're very excited uh, uh, for that and I'm very excited because today we're doing Zinfandel. And Zinfandel is always a ton of fun. If uh, you know, welcome, yeah, again, all to all of you who are joining us via Zoom, especially. There are a whole lot of you uh, joining us this time. Uh, you know, I guess the, the concept of day drinking with John and Rory just really kept, catches fire. So, you know, <laughs> we're, we're happy to be here with you. Um, for those of you joining via Zoom, um, we do have the Q&A open. And so we definitely encourage everybody to ask Q&A, uh, ask questions in the Q&A. And, and really importantly, if you already see a question that you like, uh, upload it. Just click the little little like button on there, and that puts it to the top of my screen. And uh, ah, I see a question coming in already. You know, it, I I can barely read, so it takes me a little while to answer the questions. It says, so, when is Rory going to get a haircut? <laughs> I gave myself a haircut this morning. Oh, yeah. so going back here. <laughs> you go another week, you're going to need a tree trimming <laughs> service. It's just going to fade in the background. <laughs> so yeah, like uh, like my dad said, we're drinking Zinfandel this time around, which is. A Zinfandel is just one of our favorite varieties, uh, always just a source of tons of fun. And uh, Dad, can I serve you a little bit of Zinfandel? Well, it goes deep into the history of Frog Sleep because along with the Sauvignon Blanc, we remember we tried the 81 Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. We're not going to try the 81 Zinfandel as far as I know this year, yeah. uh, this week, but uh, this goes back to the original two wines that we made back in 1981. So absolutely, let's get the drinking started right now. <laughs> for you. Oh, oh I see. okay, here we go. Get you a little. Uh, you know the legend of red coffee, don't you? Tell me about it. Tell me about it. <laughs> well, many years ago, uh, you know, when we we started wine in '81, uh, but it was '83 before we uh, were ready to sell our first Zinfandel, and that was the year. It was the second year of the Napa Valley Wine Auction, and we wanted to be uh, part of this. Your mom, Larry, and I, and so uh, we called the wine auction and said, "Hey, can we do a lunch or dinner?" And they they were quite up. We uh, all of our lunches and dinners are full, and so we go, oh, you know. And they said, well, what about a breakfast? And they said, well, no one does a breakfast. And I said, well, we'll do a breakfast then. And they said, well, no one will come to a breakfast. Holy crap, a lot of people came to the <laughs> breakfast. But, you know, so we had a big coffee urn, like the 100 cups for uh, coffee. And so all these people started coming. And immediately uh, they said, well, where's the wine? You know, it, 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 experienced day drinkers here, yeah. Experienced day drinkers, right? Well, we didn't have any wine. We only had five wine glasses, all different sizes. And, uh, but we had 150 wine uh, or coffee cups. So we started pouring uh, Zinfandel in coffee cups and it was the talk of all wine auctions. So, and you know. thus the legend of red coffee was born. So uh, <laughs> uh, we've got our mugs here and dad. Yeah, here we go. Here's the day. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you drink wine out of as long as you're drinking. And I know a lot of you are like uh, working from home now and it is a little embarrassing before 10 o'clock. Uh, so yep. I think we should put the question out. How many people actually? Uh, I, think that, I think we've got a poll question ready to go. Uh, how many of you have had wine for breakfast? And I, I just say it's it's an all-American thing. In the spirit of all-day breakfast, you can have all-day wine. You know, that's really good, but I actually think I prefer it out of a wine glass. <laughs> <laughs> Zinfandel, Rory. What's it like to grow a Zinfandel? So Zinfandel is just, uh, I mean, it's one of those grapes that is uh, incredibly fun to grow. It's it is a, it's a grape that I think a lot oh of people God. associate really with, with California, you know, with, mm -hmm. with American wine and especially California wine making um, Zinfandel as it's known in the States. Um, I just want to make clear too for everybody who um, uh, has, does, may not have, we, we know that some of you aren't able to get the wines in time or if you have an effect, you just kind of join us for fun. Maybe you don't have a bottle of Zinfandel with you. What? You don't have a bottle of Zinfandel in the house? <laughs> <laughs> If you don't, I'll say that's okay. I would just say that you should reach for uh, a bottle that everybody has, which, Dad, you have a, a, an example for them. Yeah, for, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did you, uh, do we have that uh, label going up? Yeah. So yeah. this is the, uh, may I show you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is the original variety of Zinfandel, correct? Yeah, it is. So How do you pronounce that sucker? I, I would just say to everybody, if you don't have uh, a bottle of uh, Zinfandel with you, make sure you grab your handy dandy bottle of Cyrilnac Castellansky, which I'm sure everybody has. In Wait, so. say that one more time. Cyrilnac Castellansky. Yeah, okay. That's the Croatian name for Zinfandel. 
And so it's just a little bit of the history of Zinfandel. They didn't know where it was from for a long time. They, they, yeah. There were theories about it uh, being a Native American grape, which we knew, which we knew not to be true quite a while. It was Vitus right? right? But everyone thought that it was the only Vitus vinifera that actually orig originated in California. Somehow magically originated <laughs> in California. So we got a shot, a shot of the label of up here uh, that you can see, C-R-L-J-E-N-E-K. Uh, so difficult to pronounce, uh, but uh, a Croatian uh, term for the grape a uh, little bit of a history with, with the, uh, the, the history of Zinfandel was really only sussed out later in the 20th century uh, by Carol Merritt. Yeah, a good friend. A yeah. good friend, fellow Napa Vintner. If you haven't tried her and her husband's wines from Ladger Merritt up, 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 up on uh, Mount Veter, they make um, Syrah and Mondus, and they also make a wine that they call Tribidrag, which is actually the original Transylvanian name, I think, for, uh, for, for the grape. I think when uh, Carol discovered the original um, uh, Zinfandel in Croatia, there were only nine mines of it left. And this is, so we almost lost to history yeah. of the true origins. Uh, this was all done by DNA analysis, as I understand. Exactly. Right? So, so one of the magical parts about DNA analysis is being able to track these grapes uh, over the, really over the centuries and over the, over the eons of how, uh, how grapes moved about the world through ancient trade patterns. Yeah. There's multiple theories about how it actually came to the United States, but came sometime in the 19th century. And uh, how it became Zinfandel, nobody's entirely sure. Uh, it's also known as Primitivo in Sicily, uh, but it's much easier to pronounce Primitivo. But um, it's the kind of uh, grape that's had a long journey to get to California. But in California, we've kind of adopted it as our, uh, as our kind of native grape. You know? Well, we certainly have it at Frog's Leaf. It, it has been uh, part of our action here for so many years. And, uh, you know, our first vine uh, vineyard that we bought, which now trace of Morris, it was all Zinfandel. It still is fantastic, uh, yeah. Zinfandel. So this has got such a storied history in the, uh, in the evolution of Frog's Leaf. And it's our fun wine. This is the wine that we bring out when we're, we're barbecuing when we're having fun when we're just uh when are we uh, not having fun by the way well you, you, there's, there's a li limited limited yeah. times that we're not having fun in some way or another uh, which is to say we drink a lot of zinfandel we do drink a lot of zinfandel. in morning noon or night essentially so yeah so uh, this is the 18 and uh about our usual percentage of um, uh, so we have a little secret with our zinfandel and that it's uh uh not all zinfandel Actually, it's true. Right. In yeah. fact, I think we discovered very early on in the going that to make a wine smell and taste more like Zinfandel, there has to be less Zinfandel in it. And that goes into the, you'll notice on the back, if you guys have the bottle of the 2018, there's 82% Zinfandel, 14% Petit Syrah, and 4% Carignan in there. So why, why would the Zinfandel not be 100% Zinfandel? It's not to say that there aren't 100% Zinfandels out there, but we discovered a long time ago, and it's the kind of, uh, it really ties into the history of how Zinfandel was planted, is planted in a lot of ways uh, in California, and that's as a field blend. And so back in the day, when we say back in the day, we mean kind of plantings from the, from the 19th century. Zinfandel when, when you, was planted pretty widely because it was easy to ripen, it had big clusters, big berries, uh, got you lots of fruit and got you in the, in the barn early in the season. But they didn't just plant Zinfandel in a single block of vines. Nowadays, we talk when we say, hey, we planted some Cabernet here. Usually that means that every single vine in a particular block is Cabernet Sauvignon, exactly the same um, clone, exactly the same variety. Um, with Zinfandel, not only were there just different sources for these Zinfandel cuttings, but also just totally different varieties. So Petit Syrah and Carignan were very commonly mixed in, interplanted within these vineyards. And a bunch of other varieties. And a bunch of other varieties. So there are things like Alicante de Bouchette, um, Carignan, uh, Grenache, Mourvedre, Mon 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 uh, all sorts of, which was known as Mataro there. Um, that's a very common thing, especially with old vine uh, Zinfandel vineyards. And it would actually serves to benefit Zinfandel, which Zinfandel is this, it's very fruit forward. And I think you get out of the 18, a very you know, fruit forward kind of presence. That's Zinfandel for you. Zinfandel is, is this vivacious expression of just delicious fruitiness, that kind of warm summer fruit. The Petit Syrah in there kind of gives it a little bit of backbone, it gives it a little more color, gives it a little more tannin. Gives it a, and the Carignan especially will add a little bit of acid to the wine. And that is kind of 
the natural way, I guess you could say, the, the, the heritage friendly way of pre-blending. And actually this isn't even a post-blending. We don't take barrels of Zinfandel and right? blend it yeah. with the heat rod. They're actually all thrown in into the same tank and they co-ferment together. It was those wines, those early field breads, and think of the wines of Joe Swan and the early, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ravenswoods and, and the and, and uh, the Ridge wines. I mean, Ridge Geyserville was always a guiding light for me, and all those wines were field blends. In other words, um, in fact, Geyserville is called Geyserville. It's not called Zinfandel because there's not enough uh, not Zinfandel enough Zinfandel to, to, to legally be. call it Zinfandel. And, and I think that's that's cool because it smells like Zinfandel does. It is the effective way to. Zinfandel can be prone to a lot of brightness and a lot of alcohol. The other varieties co-fermenting together are the natural way of bringing the alcohol content down as these wines start into the high 13s, low 14s, which is where most of our wines fall. All of our wines. Where we, where we like to make the yeah. where we like to make yeah. the wine, and so it's it's a bit of a tribute, and I think kind of just a a way of following that um, you know, the, the wisdom of of these old field blends, which is to have this mix in there that really enhances, it doesn't make it taste less like Zinfandel, it actually enhances what we love about Zinfandel, which is this brightness and this, and this beautiful life. And beautiful Certainly haven't here in the 18. Are you smelling and tasting this one? I've been, I've still been drinking at my 17s. I love that, the 17 minutes The 17 minutes so is much. gorgeous, yeah. Uh, but this, this one is a- The 18, which has just come out, is uh, one of our, one of my favorite wines, uh, one of my favorite Zinfandels we've ever made. And uh, yeah, definitely uh, we had, Question about here on the, the corks versus the 14. If you've already popped the 14 and the 18, you'll notice the corks are different. Yeah. Um, the cork on the 2018 is a- Back to the old cork question. Yeah, the old cork <laughs> question. Uh, that is a Dion cork. And so this is a, uh, a cork that's specifically formulated to, um, it's made up of real cork. And then they use a, a beeswax derived binder to uh, put the cork back together after essentially tearing it apart taking out any chance of it getting cork taint or what's known as trichloroamisole, the chemical that makes it taste like what makes corked wines get corked, essentially. And Zinfandel, uh, it, it's tragic to, um, to have any wine that's corked, but it's almost more tragic with Zinfandel, which is this, you're, you're popping up in this bottle, you're, you're so you're happy to open it. Up. I mean, you got your barbecues ready and it's the, it's the you know, it's the summer evening and you're just, you're you ready might, to go. You might be celebrating your 50th birthday. Yeah, and we'll give a little shout out to Yale who uh, was supposed to be here today, visiting the winery um, and uh, for- Can I say birthday. how weird it is? I mean, it is so, we're getting a little rain today, which is wonderful and much needed, right? Uh, we're low rainfall, you're kind of like 14, which we're gonna talk about in a second. So it's a light misting rain down yeah, here, the cherries are- uh, you, you're topping up. I, I got short cord. You know, Wait, you're, you're cord yourself. <laughs> so <that's your> <laughs> uh, it's so beautiful. It, it's just so weird because this is the time of year so many of you like to visit and be at the winery and God, we love it when you come. And of course, the situation now is the uh, we're closed down for visitors and uh, we miss you guys. We really, really miss you. And so let's, let's uh, uh, toast the 18 and say, may we all soon be back together. Uh, so we can drink together. Cheers, anyway, cheers we to that. Actually, we got touched. No, we touched touch, touch the bottom of the glass. There, right? there you go. Anyway, there's a good question on here about what is our definition of old vine Zinfandel, mm -hmm. and it is a uh, it's a peculiar feature of American wine law that there is no definition of old vine. You could plant a vine in the like ground. Reserve, it, it, kind of like reserve. Um, there's very very little uh, regulation uh, around that kind of thing. And in a lot of ways, that's a good thing because that's the same kind of regulation that tends to put constraints on creativity with winemaking. Uh, you, you find it in Italy and France occasionally where some of the most creative and expressive winemakers often have to work outside of the official rules because they're doing things that are so groundbreaking, so cutting edge that they, they have to label their wine. They can't label their wine as being from this town because if they do that, they have to follow X and Y rule and have their wines tasted by a panel of judges. Um, I think it's interesting with old vine where, in a sense, we all know what an old vine is. You know it when you, know it when you see it. Um, but by law, you, you can- You mean like pornography? <laughs> I wasn't going to go there. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> but thank you for bringing up that old, that old, that old reference. Um, but you know, you could plant a, I could plant a vine in the ground tomorrow and call it, call it old vine. I think that it is worth highlighting the 
the private efforts of uh, the Historic Vineyard Society, which if you're uh, interested, if you're a big fan of Old, Zim old Vines and Pendals, that's a, it is a, a organization that you should really look into. Um, it's organized by uh, uh, great producers, Ridge, uh, Bedrock, Turley, um, uh, I think Nall is, is part of it as well. Uh, Mike Officer from Carlisle is a, is a big part of it. All great Zinfandel producers, and they are dedicated to. I forgot the question. What are you to certifying about? these old vineyards and old having vineyards. having a you know a verified uh, uh, effort to say, hey, this is an actual old vine vineyard, and more to go beyond that and say, let's preserve these old vine vineyards because I think that there's a there's something interesting about Napa Zinfandel, which is that it's it's a little bit in danger. It's uh, oh, it's an endangered species, no doubt. We'll talk about that. But you know, so now the White Barn Vineyard, which is, along with the Molinari is the basis of this wine, right? Uh, it, that those vines are only about uh, 40 years old. Would you call that old? Or I mean, you're not, you're less than 40, so you probably think that's old. I'm a little bit more than 40, so I, I mean, 40, 40 is so old. That it's, just, <laughs> it's hard for me to com comprehend just how old that is actually. Um, no, it, it, by their definition, not an old vine vineyard, but. I think we have a photo of a, a cool photo of the White Barn Vineyard to put up, planted in 1978. The White Barn Vineyard, which is in the St. Helena area, so just north of Rutherford, uh, is our primary source of Zippendel together with the Molinari Vineyard in the center of St. Helena. That's a cool photo of the vineyard. That's our, it's 100% Zippendel at that particular vineyard, um, planted in 1978. And it's, um, I think, uh, just one of the coolest vineyards we have. It sits right up above the town of St. Helena, right up against the western mountains of, of Napa Valley. And that's kind of, you know, Deb, we'll, we'll kind of tie it back into the original Zinfandel here in a second, because that's kind of the gold coast for Zinfandel. And it, it this, is. this vineyard sits right above the sort of matriarch of Napa Valley Zinfandel Vineyard, which is the old Hain Vineyard, which was planted yeah. in 1903, is still in the ground almost, almost miraculously. It's uh, beset by, at all sides by houses and Cabernet and things like that. But it, it really is kind of the, uh, the OG place for Zinfandel in, uh, in, Nap in, in Napa County, really. And a lot of the budwood for our vineyards and a lot of the budwood for Napa Valley Zinfandel vineyards comes from the Hain Vineyard. And that is uh, just right down the road from the original source of the of the 1881. The, the 81 Zinfandel was all from the Spotswood Vineyard, which of course is now Cabernet Sauvignon. And why we talk about Zinfandel being uh, endangered in the Napa Valley is that in fact it does best in the soils that are absolutely perfect for Cabernet Sauvignon. Yep. And an average ton of Cabernet Sauvignon in Napa is worth what now over ten thousand dollars, and much more in, in many vineyards, right? Mm -hmm. And an average ton of Zinfandel is worth four or five thousand dollars. Less, less than half of that, yes. Less than half of that, and so farmers thinking, what should I uh, uh, do here? Should I uh, uh, grow more Cabernet or should I grow more Zinfandel? And so many of the beautiful old vineyards of Zinfandel have uh, been taken out for the express purpose of making Cabernet Sauvignon. And we can understand the reasons why, Definitely for can. sure, from an economic point of view, but it breaks my heart every time I see an old Zinfandel vineyard go under the knife again. It's absolutely true. And so when you're drinking the Zinfandel, you're, you're drinking something that's an increasingly rare, uh, rare creature in Napa County. Um, but it's just too bad. It's, it, that's the way life goes, but it is, uh, it is very, very cool to uh, still drink. Zin from Napa County. And I think this, yeah. our, our 18 Zin is really something we just, we love to drink, we love to make, and we are committed to the grape. So this one's got all the baby fat, all the Beaujolais sort of wonderful fruitiness going on. What's five years do? Well, I'm glad you asked. I think we should try and find out. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'll check your math and uh, tell you that it was actually four years between 2018 and 2014. Well, there was that extra long year in there. Though. Oh, right. Because of the leap year. Yeah, because of the leap year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't try to give me like math problems. <laughs> hey, I was an English major. I don't know what you're, I don't know what you're asking me for. <laughs> I understand it was Jackie's birthday, not not yours. No, yeah, yeah, we screwed that up. Well, you know, this is what happens when we've been drinking. He asked us to do things after we've had a, our first glass of wine, which yeah. maybe we should do this earlier in the day when we haven't had it. Right around six o'clock in the morning before yeah, we start drinking. Okay, yeah, that would be good. Yeah. So now, if you have it. Uh, why, yeah, why don't you take take the smell of the 2014 Zinfandel? Yeah. Let's take. A, I'm actually curious myself. 
well, this was a crazy vintage and it reminds me a little bit about what's going on now because we're looking at about half the rainfall we normally get in a vintage here in, in 2020, right? That's where we stand now, but we're getting beautiful right now. And they, say, right now. they say an inch in March is worth three inches, what, in, in November or, or something like that? More than, yeah. Uh, but to this uh, 2014 was the driest of all the drought years, about half of the annual rainfall. Um, and I think it was interesting. It's uh, every time that there's a, a drought vintage in uh, in Napa, we get lots of questions about dry farming. Oh, well, no, we, no. we have frogs sleep there. Oh, their vines are toast because uh, they don't because they dry farm and they, they're they're totally hopeless. Um, I think it's 14 for me. Down actually being back at the winery, that was the first time I'd ever been. You know responsible for vines that were going through uh going through a drought vintage or being up close and yeah. being really up close and personal that was a year where i was on the vineyard crew yeah. pruning the vines suckering the vines leafing uh joining the picking crew uh going through all the all the steps and it was for me i've never had a vintage uh, the 14 is, is special for me because i've never had a vintage that reinforced so strongly our belief in dry farming yeah. which this yeah. was a vintage again less than half of our normal of our normal annual rainfall i think it was something like 15 or 16 inches very very little rainfall for, for napa valley and did the vines struggle did the vines lose their crop did they drop all their leaves were they kind of sputtering towards the end no so one of those beautiful I'm venture out see if you agree with me that actually these these low rainfall years the vines actually seem to reach deeper into their terroir in terms of look at the nuance that's in this one. Now, it's lost a lot of that really fruit forward sort of, it, it, we need to talk about concrete aging and, and mm -hmm. some of the things we're doing with the, the way we're bringing the petite sirop. And I think there are differences between the 18 and the 14 that are different than just the vintages, but I do believe this wine has got nuance that's very special to the 14. Well, and, and I think it's, it's something that is true, and it's not always believed of Zinfandel that it's got layers to it. And when you taste the 18, you get all that, baby, like you said, the baby fat, the, the big bright fruitiness. I think with the 14, that I, I'm getting the floral and the, the, the kind of beautiful perfume that I love out of Zinfandel. And I think the 18 starts to flex a little bit of that. If you have a bottle of the 2017, I think especially has a nice, beautiful, it's starting to evolve into this perfumed kind of character. And the 14 is really showing that uh, in a nice way where some of that, yeah, extremely youthful fruitiness is, has worn away to reveal something a little uh, kind of special. I yeah. think it's, yeah. it's not something that, you know, even, even Zinfandel that's not very old, the 14 is not very, very old, still reveals kind of a unique quality about Zinfandel that I think you're right in a way that what do you mean I'm right in a way? I think I'm like, well, you're only just ever right in, in a very specific way, but it's, uh, <laughs> today, I, mean. <laughs> I, I think when that, you, get a haircut, you know, the, <laughs> you always the question of the, I think it's trending on Twitter, you know, hashtag, get hashtag beard. Rory's beard. Yeah. 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 There you go. Um, the thing about Zinfandel and these drought vintages is it really uh, it allows the vines, I think in a way to just show what they've got. They've developed these root systems. These vines are intelligent. In a big rainfall year, uh, like a 2017, for example, where we got tons of rainfall, um, you're, those vines are not needing to pull as many re water resources out of the ground. They've got, they're smart to be able to adapt to that situation. In 14, yeah, these vines are putting every darn last effort they can into finding water in the soil. But you know what? They've grown and they're, they're, they've adapted to their soil to the point where they're prepared for that. They're not dumb. They're not sitting there going, oh, where's my irrigation water, dude? Well, and honestly, I think that when we talk about older vines, I think we're really talking about wise vines. And there's something that comes with being an older vine, like an older person, where you actually have got enough experience to say, we've been through this before. Let's not, you know, uh, let's, um, let's take it a look. So I, I, interesting I, question. I <laughs> Let, let's skip over that. <laughs> I was trying to get a plug in for older people. But here's an interesting question. Now, uh, and, and maybe you can answer for both the 18 and the 14. You're, you mentioned you were a St. John, a, a proud Johnny. You, know, you read the great books. Uh, what's the good book to read when you're uh, tasting Zinfandel? When you're, when you're enjoying Zinfandel, when you're drinking Zinfandel. Um, boy, that's a good question. Because uh, you can't do it. Show Milton. <laughs> Milton. Milton's only good when you're, you're drinking like lye solution or something like that. You know, you don't, you don't want to be drinking that. 
No, I, th I think uh, Zinfandel is the time for bouncy poetry, you know, for that, oh, yeah. for just, and, and really that's the time for, for less so than reading, that's the time for music, you know, that's the time for just really enjoying it and having this kind of upbeat tempo. I think um, you're, I think you're, uh, you know, Abe Scherner would give a better answer to this question. <laughs> I'm sure he'll, we'll bring him on next time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think also there's a, there's a good question here about whether we would describe our Zoom as more traditional or a unique style for Napa County. Because I think it's, uh, Zinfandel often has this, uh, you know, we can have a reputation for being boozy, you know, for being kind of a little over the top with the fruitiness and over the top with the alcohol and sometimes even a little bit of, you know, toss a little or leave a little sugar in there. Um, but yeah. I, I, it's, a, it's a fair question for you, Dad. And I'll ask this directly for me where our Zinfandel has always, has always had a, a unique style to it. And often that's in contrast with other Zinfandels you can find out there. And I, I'm curious myself about how you would describe that? How would you describe our style of Zinfandel and, and how you got there to begin with? Well, it looked very, we put it right on the front of our, our brand new label, by the way. Can I, you know, this is the first <laughs> Zinfandel with our label. And we talk about balance, restraint, and respect for the natural expression of the wine. And quite honestly, those words were written and initially conceived by me as the way to describe our Zinfandel, right? And why would you give up on our values of what we think wine truly is with any varietal? And Zinfandel, look, it's made in a wide variety of scales. So that's absolutely fine. We appreciate that. Some of those wines are good with roasted tires. I mean, those are valuable wines, um, but not us. That's Some like they're, they're good for fuel oil. You know, know, they're you know, they're warm you up on them, you know, like, you know, you know. <laughs> They, if you, they could disinfect your hands and you know. That's not the kind of, do not use this as hand sanitizer. Uh, uh, it, it is, it's really our fundamental values as a winery applied to Zinfandel essentially, and always has been. And it's just unique style. And look, we have, no one, everyone knows that they're different styles and they appeal to different people. This is just, if you are gonna drink a frog seed Zinfandel, this is what you're gonna get. Balance, restraint, and respect. And I think it kind of goes back to why we make any of our wines in the way we do. Uh, you know, we you'll, you'll sometimes catch us drinking some wine early in the morning. We sometimes you'll catch us keep drinking wine for lunch and sometimes for dinner. Uh, turns out we kind of drink a lot of our own wine uh, pretty 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 regularly. <laughs> and it's one thing that's really nice when you're drinking a lot of your own wine is to make a, a bottle of wine that you enjoy. That and that it's just I think that you need that style that of the lower alcohol, the higher acidity, the more just emphasizing the freshness is yeah, what we've always been about. I mean, alcohol is, I mean, look, I don't mind getting a buzz, but I like a buzz on a whole bottle out of sip, you know, and, and, and some of these ones are just too strong. So. We should get another poll question. Who's on the one, on the two bottle a day plan? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> home sheltering. Who thinks a magnet's a little too much for one, but not enough for two? Oh, especially right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, so look, we've uh, made some changes in our, the way we're doing this in and in, in the Real big change started to occur with the, the 16 minutes when we incorporated the uh, the small concrete uh, uh, tanks into our, our protocols. And uh, well, I'll, whereas I'll take full credit for having uh, thought of that. And, want, for, and for once, I will actually give you full credit for this. <laughs> but you want to go ahead and, and give me your yeah. opinion because you, you followed this through. You, you, you've worked with this idea. Yeah, I think it ties a lot into, you know, when you taste the 14 and when you taste the 18, what, what we hope that you're getting out of it is this this feeling of just life and vivacity and freshness and uh it's not this heavy or plodding wine or overly serious wine it's instead it's got all this life and energy packed into a very you know into, into the bottle and we were finding that we, we've always been of the opinion that lots of new oak lots of new oak barrels in the wine tends to suppress that life and that vivacity. You, you, yeah. We don't want a lot of new oak in our, and really in any of our wines, but especially Zinfandel is easily kind of knocked off by, by lots of new oak. We were also finding that lots of old oak, and by that we yeah. mean oak barrels that were seven, eight, nine years old, was kind of going the other way around and suppressing the life and the vivacity of the wine. And we were kind of a little bit flummoxed because uh, barrels don't just materialize out of out of nowhere. You have to buy them, and you buy them new, and they have new oak flavor. Um, and you know you want a certain percentage of that in the wine with certain blocks. Um, but if you buy too many of them, you have a, a you know 
you have an oaky wine and if you, it, but if you don't buy enough of them, all of a sudden you have a lot of old oak in your cellar and we were having the other problem. So I will say, I, I will give you 100% full credit for having the idea. I know we, we've got this re recorded, right? I think I'm going to come back for, for posterity. Yeah. I will give you credit <laughs> oh my God. for the idea of parents out there. Look at this. Happening. An alternative <laughs> storage for Zinfandel, which we do now about 50% of our Zinfandel is stored in concrete tanks. 240 gallons, so concrete tanks that are unlined. They're not paint enameled with anything. They're not uh, uh, lined with glass or stainless steel. They're just specially formulated concrete uh, in 240 gallon sizes. That's about four barrels. Um, and we have 70 of these to hold half of our Zinfandel. And it, we, what we've, uh, you know, what I was massively surprised to find out, of, and you were obviously expecting as the progenitor of this idea, uh, was that <laughs> instead of if it just being this kind of neutral container, which a, a concrete we would you wouldn't expect to have any oak flavor because it's not oak, made of oak. W would you expect it to have concrete flavor? We were <laughs> desperately hoping that it would not have concrete flavor because we we don't really want to give that to you guys either. But instead, we found that these concrete vessels preserve really concentrated and preserved all that life. And freshness. In the we world. talked a little bit about when we tasted the Rachel Rossi Reserve, a little bit, yeah. and also the leaf suspension, in, 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 which we found in the, even these square or cubic uh, tanks. Uh, uh, we, we got this uh, this almost interior batonage, which has built, I think, a thickness in the wine that is yeah. belies the alcohol content. Exactly, in, in, in and, and that, that to me certainly that was the greatest surprise with all of this was having this wine that was on the one hand more full of life, just absolutely vivacious and, and bright, I mean, bright fruit to the point where you're like, wow, this was just fermented yesterday, even though it had been in the, if it had been in a tank for five months, it was like, it was, it was newly minted. And yet it had to it this richness and this depth, which is the thing that you are looking for out of new oak barrels that we're, we don't ever look for in new oak barrels, which we use about in the Zinfandels, about 11 to 15% new oak. And what we love out of these oak barrels is not the oak flavor. Instead, it's, it tends to add to the middle palate or the richness of the wine. And we found that we were getting that with these concrete tanks without the oak flavor. Now, there, the character in a new oak barrel is slightly different. And we do use, still use a little bit of the, the new oak, but we've been able to cut out all of, have a very small percentage of new oak barrels, and then also a very small percentage of old barrels so that we're able to kind of keep that balance in the wine and, uh, and uh, really just emphasize what we love about the grape. Well, and, 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 and honestly, uh, you know, we don't make decisions at Frog's Leap without considering the ecological and social implications of those decisions. And the idea of using a reusable container instead of, I mean, you cut down a 75 year old oak tree to make what, five or six barrels. And, um, and that's, that's, you know, you buy four or 500 barrels. That's a lot of trees basically. The idea of this is a renewable resource. I think it has also some very uh, spectacular uh, ecological considerations as well. Plus, they look cool. You know, yeah, you get yeah. the frogs that glow on there, and you kind of walk down. We should have a picture of oh, yeah. uh, next year. Next, next, next time. So, a couple of cool questions on here, Dad. So, we accidentally uh, uh, from Jamie Bennett. So, we accidentally opened a 2017 Zinfandel from Molinari Vineyards. Oh, oh, so what a nice nice accident! Uh, <laughs> can you comment on the difference of that? So, Molinari is one of our. Uh, uh, our other primary Zinfandel vineyard in Saint, in the St. Helena Appalachian, grown by the Molinari family, Gold family Coast, for, yep. uh, for many generations. Uh, the current generation, Pete, uh, Pete the third, right? Pete the third. Pete yeah. the third, yeah. Uh, uh, no, there's a Pete the fourth now. There's a Pete the fifth. Actually. Oh, there is? Yeah, there's oh, the, Pete the fourth. This one, there's Pete the fifth. Yeah, we call repeat, and then there's a little repeat. Um, so the Molinari family, which have, uh, when we talk about being a family winery, uh, I talk about a lot about being, just being a multi-generational winery. And so I've known the Molinari since I was a little kid. Uh, Ellie Molinari was in my class growing up. And so the Molinari Vineyard has been a, a big component of, that, of, of the wow. Frog's Egg Zinfandel. I would say um, without the wine here in front of me, when I think about the Zinfandel from Molinari versus the regular Zinfandel, or we'll compare it to our garden vineyard, the white garden vineyard that we talked about earlier, from White Barn, it's it's a little bit more high tone. It's uh, brighter, kind of more reddish fruit. Mid Valley and, location. Yeah. And whereas the Molinari is often our darkest and densest Zinfandel. Yeah. And 
there's especially a couple blocks there. I'm not sure which block we actually selected for that. I think it might've been the Dickerson block. Um, always has this kind of extra layer of density to it that is just um, one of the, for us, it, it's astounding because it's, it's, a, it's something that you wouldn't always expect going in. When you're picking the grapes, it's not something you're necessarily tasting in the grapes right away, but when the wine is through ML and we're tasting it in the winter, it's just sort of like, whoa, where did all that concentration and richness come from? We, we should probably back up because a lot of people wondering what the hell we're talking about in the, in the if, if you're not a frog fellow, you need to understand it. Uh, we bottle uh, uh, frequently for our own uh, edification, but also for the enjoyment of our frog fellows, individual vineyard lots uh, separated out of our main Zinfandel blend. So this would be an individual bottling specifically for frog exactly. fellows. Yeah. And so just so you, if those of you are not uh, tuned in uh, yeah. to what that means. So, so uh, we, we, do, we do make those selections for most of the most of the varieties every year and Molinari well, it's often a big part of us deciding how to handle those uh, different blocks and different wines too so I, I, i'm a genius here yeah. Yeah. Um, i think there's a, rel a relevant question to that what is it like to work with your dad slash son and i think uh the phrase indentured servitude comes to mind here uh yeah yeah <laughs> on both sides <laughs> it's uh it's incredibly fun um it's a family winery. We're here dedicated. Uh, to give me that shit. I can see you in the camera. Oh, I know. <laughs> this doesn't do anything. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we're committed as a family winery here at Frog Sleep. Um, that's uh, for better or for worse. That's not always the case in Napa, in Napa Valley. I don't really pass judgment on those kinds of things. But um, my dad and my mom and uh, everybody who's ever been involved with, with Frog Sleep is all in on Frog Sleep. Um, yeah, I'm and your brother and your sister. Yeah. I have brother and sister. You do have a I thought we disinherited them. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Connor. Sorry, Kelly, if you're watching. Um, you know, the, our family is all in on that. And so that means finding ways to work with people you'd rather not hang out with every day. <clears throat> But it, over. what's the next question? <laughs> the next question? <laughs> but I, I think uh, when you are working with uh, a family member or you're working with people like uh, Pablo Polanco, who gave me my first job in the winery, um, I think it's a reminder of the longevity of the winery and just how important it is to kind of keep things going. And Dad, I, I see you. I mean, well, you know, when we talk about family winery, it's really important to, we have 16 families working here between all of our vineyards and our hospitality staff, I mean, all, all the great people that so many of you have met. This is, a, this is a family winery in a greater sense of the word too. And I, I take great pride in that. And, and I take great pride in the fact that all those people are employed right now in the, as we go through this uh, uh, crisis. And so um, I'm gonna get emotional yeah. here, but, yeah, but it's it, fine. It, it, it's <laughs> worth, it is worth stepping back that, to, to say, we, we are all into the point where everybody at Frog Sleep is, is in on this and uh, we are keeping everybody employed right now. And that's why we're especially happy that all of you guys are joining us and, and drinking the wine with us and buying and the buying wine, wine and, wine. Uh, <laughs> and uh, helping us out through this, uh, what I know is a difficult time for, for everybody, uh, not, not, not just us. And then I think, you know, yeah. we, we, we took a step back and tasted the 14 here and that yeah. a little bit of that baby fat, fat removed. Right. And I think we're, so we've, got a, we've got a special wine here. It's that, time to get serious. Yeah. It's time to get serious. And it's, uh, yeah, it's time, I believe, to pull out the 91, uh, the 91's. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, oh nice you court, Dad. Dad. Don't you think. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks for not using your teeth. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but how did you screw that up? So, yeah. That's so important. So I uh, put your monocle in yeah. here. We're so, trying to carry this gang off. So we are uh, tasting the 91. Uh, James, we're tasting the 91 Zinfandel. It's yeah. hard to get serious. Uh, here, and we are. The 91, uh, the 91 Zinfandel has entered what is often referred to as its claret phase. And so. Claret is an English term for old Bordeaux, and so we always feel it's appropriate whenever drinking our old Zinfandels to don our monocle and uh, my God, God sir, my God, God. Stop. that's just great stuff. Oh, Seriously, goodness. that is a different animal, though. I I remember a conversation very very early with Louis Martini. Of course, Mike Martini was my uh, 
and a classmate at Davis. I met his dad. I never met the, the, uh, the original Louis, but uh, um, uh, uh, Mr. Martini uh, said to me, he says, make sure you don't let your Zinfandels get too old or they start smelling like those damn French wines, or the <laughs> damn Bordeaux wines, right? Which were an Italian. He couldn't think of anything, there was anything worse, worse to say. say. There was no, there there's no four letter words. Really, really, really do. I mean, it is, I am, I refuse to taste um, old wines um, of, of this is 30 years old, right? Um, without knowing what variety it is, because it is t way too easy to mistake a, a, a beautiful Zinfandel with a beautiful old Cabernet so. When we talk about the wine losing its baby fat over time, so this, the Zinfandel, 91 Zinfandel has lost all of that kind of, uh, you know, like, hey, happen to see you, you know, right, hey, let's right. go, let's it's, have a barbecue, let's go party. It's put know? its monocle on. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. put its monocle on. It's, this is it, the most bogus monocle I've ever seen in my life. What are you life. talking about? Uh, it's, it's, it works it's, as well as any monocle I've ever had. It's a paper clip. Two paper clips. With the, yeah, that's a binder clip, actually. So, and a keychain I just bought from CS Hardware. Oh my God. We, need, we need some help on our gags, you guys. We don't have any money. We have no money in the budget anymore. You know? <laughs> I tried to get a monocle and they, they wouldn't approve it. Yeah, fair enough. But this, you know, the 91's in, we talk about it. So the Claret, in case you misunderstood my English uh, English accent, my fabulous Dick Van Dyke derived. Uh, yeah, you did really good job. Um, it just it turns into this. A little bit of the mushroom, a little bit of the leather, but really this kind of beautiful perfume and uh, the souvoir, the, the forest floor kind of aroma. Boy, here's another great example of when you open an older wine and give it some time, though. I yeah. mean, this wine should have been decanted an hour ago almost. It is, it, you, it's tight still, it really is. It's a genie coming out of I, I think it's, you know, this goes back down to, to the first, uh, the first uh, live case that we did uh, with the Cabernets when we were tasting yeah. an older Cabernet, which is, we had a question about decanting, which is, you know, decanting for the purpose of making a wine achieve a certain flavor, I'm not always a big fan of. But I, I would say even more so than decanting, put this in your glass and uh, try your hardest. I mean, this is really hard for some of you to not drink all of it in one gulp. Um, and just pour enough in that glass that you can let it sit there and let it evolve and really let it decant in your glass and open up over time. Because even the 91s, this wine is still alive. This wine like totally. from one of the most legendary vintages ever in that. Oh, I thought you said one of the most legendary wine makers. <laughs> <I was right. laughs> yeah, I've already given you praise once yeah, in this yeah, case. Yeah, 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 you only get one. one. You only get one. So. Fair enough. I was asking for too much. <laughs> Well, I hope a few of you have this wine, but it really is, it is, it is an example. And again, what's the purpose of Zinfandel? If, if you're, if you're enjoying Zinfandel to, to, to have your barbecue and so on, you want to drink this wine when it's younger, but it's nice to have a few of these in the cellar too, to every now and then go back and remind yourself what Zinfandel is. Is it a no, question for you, is Zinfandel a noble variety? Or is it only noble when it's grown in certain places under certain conditions? No, it's a noble variety for sure. And I think that what reveals that that is that we, um, you know, we taste we taste lots of Napa Zinfandels. So like, apparently they make wine in Sonoma. And what? So we started tasting wines from Sonoma, which if you've not heard, they do make wine over there. We just found out. Can you decide? Obviously, some of the most fabulous Zinfandels uh, from California, from Sonoma Boy, County. It's going to cover. Sorry, Norm. Uh, Sorry, Doug. <laughs> and it's, uh, I think, not that anyone from Sonoma. It's grown. Watching. It's grown all over California, and uh, even in, in up in the foothills and Paso Robles and Lodi. And I think that the the lie of well, you know, it's only good from here or it's only good from there. When you start finding great vineyards in all of these different sites, yeah. it gets really hard to say, well, it's only good because it's grown in, the, in, uh, in this place or in that place. I think it's, it's the definition of that noble grape, it, of, the, of a noble grape is that kind of grape which can be put into lots of different, you know, situations, lots of different terroirs and really reflect the, to that terroir. Yeah. I think that our Zinfandel is terroir. a Napa Zinfandel. But, in, you know, for that, I think that it's a little bit quieter. I think it's not this kind of super high octane Zinfandel, but it, instead it lends itself more to the perfume style. Mm -hmm. Whereas you go up into the foothills and maybe you get something that's a little bit rockier, a little bit stonier, a little, maybe a little bit more kind of, uh, you know, focused on the, uh, on the super rich side of things, but in the, in the right expression could be really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you 
go to Rock Pile, where you go to Dry Creek Valley, you go to the Sonoma Valley, you taste Monte Rosso, which is high, high elevations in the Delta, they all taste different. They all taste like the place where they're grown uh, when they're, again, farmed with responsibility and, and made honestly. Um, and I think you have a lot of producers all over the state who do that. And so, yeah, it's a noble grape. And it, it's, it's not worthy of being just kind of cast aside as this, yeah. hey, it's just this fruity wine, which you can do that. You can grow it and, and you know, like most other varieties, you can just kind of make it industrially and you get a certain product out of it. But there are enough people doing, doing things with care with Zinfandel that, uh, yeah, it is for sure a noble grape. And I think it, well, it's extremely a, exciting all over the state. Its ability to age also is another good sign, right? Yeah. And, and so, yeah, this is, this is fabulous. So what are people saying out there? What do you guys think of this wine? Let us know, please. Uh, this is a uh, interactive tasting, right? We, we get to yeah. be, yeah, got I had a question about how do our California Zinfandels compare to those grown and made in Europe? And so, you know, there was another question about whether Primitivo is also Zinfandel. Primitivo is, and, and this is where it gets interesting. You know, Pr Primitivo is, from a, from a DNA perspective, it is Zinfandel. It is the same variety as Zinfandel. It is, you know, going to be a different clone, which means it's going to have slight genetic variabilities, just like there are different clones of Cabernet, different clones of different, all these different varieties that are only slightly different genetically. When you get a bigger difference, that's when you call them a different variety. When you get an even bigger difference, you call, that's why you call it a different species. And so Primitivo, in, in, which is what its name in Sicily and, and, uh, and how it's grown in California, it, I think the you get a bigger difference in style there with just the fact that it's Sicily versus, uh, versus California. And you get uh, Sicily's very, very low, low rainfall, warmer, even a warmer climate than well, California. Could, could you ask the question, well, it's the same, what's the difference between Cabernet Sauvignon Gros and the Medoc and, and, yeah. and the Rutherford Bench, right? And, 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 there, and, and it would be a freaking shame if they tasted the same. Yeah. Right? No. Yeah. We, if, if they taste the same, then somebody's done something wrong. And, and it's actually my, can I get on a rag here? Because it's my biggest Dude, do, you need a, do you need a soapbox? I might need a box. You need a soapbox over here. <laughs> when you try to imitate the wine made somewhere else, you're making a huge mistake. In yeah. wine making. I think you're yeah. making the most fundamental error you can make in wine making. It's great to be inspired by the wines from Europe. It's great to be inspired by the wines from Europe. But you need to take that inspiration and apply it to the sense that all wine should reflect where they come from, this natural expression of the wine or this idea of terroir. And anything short of that is criminal, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so, uh, whereas I respect I mean, it, it may not literally criminal, criminal but it, well, I mean, yeah, you know, if I were wine, that would be, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to have you read the criminal code. Though. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> You know, and I think that along those points, there's a good question here about are any of your new vineyard techniques such as crimping expected to change yield or character of any of your wines, including sin? And I think that what really ties into that is that when you are looking to, um, thank you for Sheridan for that question. Um, when you're looking to make a wine that reflects the place where, where it's grown, yeah. that's, not a, that, that's not a journey that stopped for us. Mm -hmm. It's not this kind of thing where we say, wow, we know everything about Rutherford Cabernet and so, uh, you know, we just click our fingers and we have a wine worthy of, of the, we get of the, the recipe. Frog yeah, we got the recipe down. Yeah. You're always looking to refine. You're always looking to improve. We're changing farming techniques and making alterations to farming techniques and, and uh, wine making techniques and how we approach the wines every year. Um, we, uh, it's, it's not, you know, it's hard to think about sometimes, but we don't actually know everything about wine. You know, I, I know it's, it's hard for everybody to accept, but. Hey, I'm yeah. seeing a great question come up here from one of our longtime listeners, Bill Quain, who uh, has asked about the difference between uh, room temperature and cellar temperature. And I can't even tell you how much I appreciate that, that question because I think we make such a huge mistake. And every time I go into a restaurant and they're serving their red wines at room temperature, which is behind the bar at 82 degrees, uh, I just, it makes my hair fall out. I mean, it, it is so wrong. Red wines should not be served at room temperature. Throw that idea away. They should be served at the temperature from which they've spent most of their life, which we call cellar temperature, which is right in that zone between 60 and 61 degrees. Not a little bit broader than that, but not much. And so please don't serve your red wine so warm. I mean, room temperature is what, 72? 
in a lot of houses it's even more to that in the summer it's even more than that that is not the correct temperature get serve them at somewhere between 60 and 65 let them come up they will warm up they will become more expressive over time but a really really good uh, question from one of the greatest wine drinkers I've ever met in my life mr Plum. thank you very much yeah. my <laughs> college roommate yeah our only listener on the <laughs> You call them on the phone sometimes just to do this. You practice these sessions. Uh, these give me a lot of gags. Right? <laughs> it's true. Uh, there's an, a good question about why we tasted the 18 first before the, before the 2014. Ah, yeah. You want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> I just blindly reached for the bottle in front of me, and I, I don't we were building the suspense up to the monocle. You know, so we, we, we don't know what we're doing for God's sakes. <laughs> There's often I I often taste younger wine starts, and this isn't always the case, um, but I often taste some of the younger wines first because they're so exuberant with their especially the fruitiness, and with Zinfandel, that's obviously. Uh, front and center, you have all this kind of, you taste the 18 right now, it's got baby fat, it can be typically more, it can be more assertive than some of the older wines, which have lost some of that uh, initial fruitiness, those, uh, the fruitiness, the ethyl esters and things like that tend to degrade over time in any wine. Um, and that really is important for Zinfandel because Zinfandel will lose some of that uh, hugeness of its fruitiness, even within just a few short years and what that can do is if you if you taste a uh you know if you taste this kind of uh, older wine and you go oh that's nice and then you taste the younger wine it kind of blows you out of the water and you go whoa you know that that has way more going for it whereas i think tasting the older wines often gives you an appreciation for the things that are that are additional to that older wine which with the 14 it's and with a lot of older wines really that it should be an addition by subtraction mm -hmm. in a way where you've certain things have fallen away out of that wine and that's allowed elements of the wine that were always there but maybe were hidden were masked by this exuberant fruitiness once that goes away it allows it to kind of come to the surface I know i'm going i'm going back to this 91 and sorry I, i'm drawn back to this and uh, this is a were you even paying attention you know this is a no i am not <laughs> you were saying uh, this is actually 100 percent zinfandel and and so let's talk about that because it's kind of like Merlot because you know uh, our Merlots often benefit from a little Cabernet Franc, a little Cabernet Sauvignon, and we talked about this idea of co-fermentation. But honestly, some of the great wines and Zinfandels in the world are 100% Zinfandels as well. Yeah. And, and but it has to be from the right vineyard. It has to be a from a terroir driven. This is a mixture 50/50. I think about uh, from uh, Trace Forest from uh, uh, the old ranch and uh, and Batuello which is an even older ranch. So uh, older ranch. Great. this wine would have been made at the old frog farm. So, yeah. uh, so this is kind of the, the, uh, from the old school location and made reference to Trace Sabores, which is uh, at my mom's vineyard. It's the vineyard I grew up on. And How about that giving a plug to your mom? Yeah, thank I will you. say, even, even, thank you. Um, it's a, a vineyard I farm for my mom and it is 1972 planted Zinfandel. And, you know, importantly for Frogsley, that was the kind of vineyard that we, uh, learned organics on and learned dry farming on and, you know, kind of learned our own kind of technique for approaching that. And that, that is a vineyard that is still dry farmed and still organically grown and 100% Zinfandel estate. You were, uh, you were four when you moved there. I, think. I just tasted the 18 out of tank yesterday. And yeah. It was, uh, yeah. it's pretty yeah. That's enough of a flood. It's there, smashing. Yeah. <laughs> um, All right. Any other good questions? Well, yeah. What's coming in here? How yeah. deep do the roots go? Deep uh, very much depends upon the soil. Um, so, you know, in a in a shallow soil, in a soil that only has a few a few feet of topsoil in it, they only go down that far. One and of the, one of the great things that happened when you go to France and go into Burgundy and you keep going down and down and down into these caves where they store their wine and you, you're what, 25, 30 feet below the ground and they'll point up and you can see the grape roots coming down through the slope. Grape roots want to go down. They're genetically predisposed to just put their roots as deep. So they will go as deep as, as, they, deep can. as they can. And even if they need to bust through pieces of rock and they're so aggressive about seeking. They'll, uh, they'll find the spaces in between the fractured rock. And, and when we talk about, you know, the 14 is a great example of this where, you know, okay, what does that mean? That the roots go deep, you know, I guess that sounds good. Maybe they're getting different flavors. 
what it really is is that vine building its own resilience to whatever's thrown at it. Oh, I've got a huge rainfall year. Okay, it's a relatively easy year for me. Um, but in a, a short rainfall year, in a, drought, in, a, in, a, in a drought year, like a 91 or a 14, right? Um, well, and sizing up to be a 2020. And sizing up to be a 2020. You know, the rain stopped, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> come on, come on, come on back. Um, that's the year where the vines really make use of those deep root systems. And I think that's the, the intelligence of a dry farm of a, of, a, of a vine that isn't irrigated is that it's, it's be, we're allowing it to follow its natural path, what it naturally wants to do, which is send its roots deep into the soil. I can't even tell you guys how important this uh, dry farming is. We all know the difference between a tomato that's grown in real dirt and one that's grown hydroponically. And I honestly feel like Grapes that are grown with too much irrigation are like hydroponically grown grapes. They just don't develop the same level of flavor. And that's pushed us into a world where we're trying to get the grapes riper and riper and riper. The alcohol's going up, the acid's going down, trying to develop more flavor, like leaving a tomato on a counter hoping it gets to taste more like a tomato. It doesn't work. Grapes have got to be deeply connected to the soil or they just don't develop the same level of flavor. And that's why dry farming is so important and why it's not legal in all the other great wine making regions. Why irrigation is not legal. Why irrigation yeah, is not often not legal. Yeah. And, and I think it ties in another good question we have here. So, which is, so do you pick those in relatively early in the season to keep the alcohol levels down? Love the freshness on the wine. I'm glad you love the freshness on the wine. The answer to, to your question is no. We do not pick our Zinfandel early. In fact, we don't pick any of our wines early. We pick them when they're ripe. And the uh, I don't know if it's magic or if it's just uh, uh, my, our own sheer brilliance as amazing viticulturists, but dry farming gives us more balanced and fully ripe grapes earlier in the season at naturally higher acidity levels so that you naturally get more freshness in the wine. It's, it's an artifice. It's an artifact of wine if you are picking it deliberately early just to say, well, we, we pick early and we got low alcohol. It's really easy to get a low alcohol wine. Hey, two you just weeks, pick it in July and you're good two, to go. Two weeks from now, we're going to have an amazing session where we're going to get on a rant about organic and, yeah. and dry farming, and biodynamic farming and natural wines and so on. So that's coming up in two weeks. And so tune in for that session because we're going to get deep into that session. <laughs> if, if you want to see us rise out of yeah. our chair like this and, and <laughs> pound may, our fists on the table. We may have to do that one standing up. I, I think we, we may actually get a little bit out into the vineyard. Just because what are we doing next week? What are we doing next? We're doing uh, our uh, weird wines, uh, the wines that we thought were a really good idea and that our sales team is still haranguing us about. Uh, um, oh, things yeah. like Chenin Blanc and our Heritage Blend. Oh which, my God, I can't wait to do Heritage I Blend. I can't wait to do it. it, it, it we have a couple other rogue things in this cell. We, we always <laughs> get some rogue things in this cell. We don't tell anybody about. Uh, so we'll be pulling out probably a couple barrel samples just for some, just for some fun to talk about some of the different varieties that we, that we go through. So tune in next week as well. Because uh, that'll be fun, but, but get prepared for uh, two weeks from now. Two weeks from now, because we're we're gonna we're gonna actually try to prepare for that one, uh, which I know this is gonna be nasty. But so uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't get too carried away. With yeah, that. fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Um, to really kind of take a deep. Dive Our producers, and, by the way, uh, you know we've got a whole team behind us here. Uh, uh, Jessica, we're now grimacing at, at us because they're and, we're and making that, reference uh, yeah. to them. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a highly highly technical group here you guys have yeah. to realize that there's a good question on here dad that i think ties into the, you know this time of year which right now we're in the shoulder season so what that means is that we've finished pruning and in about three weeks two or three weeks we're going to start suckering the vines and those are the kind of the two of the major actions in the vineyard and in between those uh, times comes April, when you're really not doing much uh, either of those things very much. Um, who is in charge of the delicious butters and jams that you include in the frog fuller shipments? And are those fruits grown at the vineyard? They are. And that is uh, an extremely important part of who we are, who we've decided to be. We've as almost owner. 40 different crops besides we do. Yeah. And so what are we doing right now? Um, we are making those. We're picking the citrus off of off the, tr off the citrus trees. Uh, we're pr finishing the pruning on the peach trees to, to help make those peach jams this summer. And uh, that's who we've become as a, as a winery. So that's in the, the province of our garden team, Chewy, Monaco, uh, Jeremy, and Dag, who, uh, who really make this all happen. I've been informed that we are very close to the Instagram live video kicking off uh, kicking all of you off. We will be restarting that video um, 
everybody who's on Zoom, please stick around. We'll, we'll be carrying through this. Everybody's on Zoom who doesn't have to rejoin Instagram. Now is your officially designated drinking break. Yeah. The monocles were really good. The monocles were really good. Really I think I'm on a terrible idea. idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm in charge of gags from you. <laughs> come on. Oh, come on. <laughs> I think okay, back with you. All right, back with you. Mm. Oh. We've, in the intervening seconds, we've grown much more serious. <laughs> um, so I think that's, uh, you know, kind of a cool question on here. What is the optimal number of years to age as a Mandel? Yeah. Don't know. It's the question I get asked the most by people who are breaking one bottle out of one bottle of my Cabernet or Zinfandel out to their car, and it's how long should be aged? You know they're going to drink it in the car on the way home. <laughs> Stop it! And there guys. is nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Please give up on this idea that there's a magic moment in the history of wine to taste it. Wines change like people over a long spread of time. You can enjoy them, enjoy knowing that person during that whole span of life, it really is the reason why you should not buy a bottle of wine, not buy six bottles of wine, but buy at least a case of wine. And sign up for the wine club. And sign up for the wine club. Because this gives you a chance to answer that question for yourself, because my answering that question for you does not give you a good answer. That question you can only answer for yourself. And what you'll come to find is that that wine changes over time and you'll probably enjoy it at every stage in its life. And that's what's really cool about it. Yeah. But do remember my famous line that wines are like people. If you're ugly when you're young, you'll be ugly when you're old. This idea that a wine is not balanced and doesn't have flavor in the beginning, you know, but it's going to magically get better later on, is just not right. But I think it's important. And we talked in our, if you haven't, if you didn't catch our first interactive tasting, we talked a lot about how the personality of Cabernet changes over time. And I think that's, that's really what it is. So what's the right personality for Zinfandel? Is it the, is it the exuberant, just totally vivacious, you know, sake in the face kind of fruit that you get with the, the youngest of the wines? Or is it the still fruity, but slightly more mature, a little more perfumed, a little more, a little more, more complexity? Uh, or is it the, and the answer to all three of those questions is yes. Yeah. They're it, all great and they, they're all fun. And that's why you have to remember that they just enjoy them. And if you forget that a bottle's in your cellar and you come out later, and what's the risk? Is that it's actually going to gone over the hill? The risk is you got to open another bottle of wine. Yeah. Which, you know, yeah. I like that. I like that proposition. <laughs> uh, it, I think it's it's just important to to realize that the, the mythology of wine being uh, better as it ages or or better you know a particular wine being better younger or older the whole notion of better or worse is it's a little bit flawed. I we got to relax over that. Yeah, it's it's it wine shouldn't be it should be this thing you share with people and you share with food. I uh, hope hope you all kind of share with us what what if you're drinking this with food. Um, it's going to get us a brontosaurus uh, burger here. You know. <laughs> You've been watching the Flintstones. <laughs> well, we have nothing to do right now. So, you know. <laughs> well, we wasted another perfectly good hour. Uh, it has been so fun to be with you with our favorite varietals in Fidel. This has just been so fun. Uh, uh, we really are enjoying bringing these uh, drinking, uh, day drinking. Uh, a day drinking with John and Rory. Uh, John and Rory sessions to you. And uh, we, we will not burden our, uh, you with our presence any longer, but we will remind you, um, go to interactive.frogsleep.com and that has all the wines that we have tasted and that we will be tasting in future sessions. You can buy the wines directly on there. You can sign up for the Zoom tasting. Buy one? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> you, it provides links to other parts of the website, which have uh, photos of your uh, yours truly and John so it's uh, and, and we will remind you guys that the, this uh, this uh, these tastings have uh, done a nice job of uh, you guys have been buying the wines this is helping us to support us in these uh, difficult times so we're uh, we're working on a session that brings a few of your friends in uh, to yeah. uh, to support some other family wineries De details so, forthcoming and details forthcoming so we very much appreciate your support of uh, us and frog sleep and 
hope you've enjoyed this last uh, hope. hour as much as I Thank have. you for joining us. We hope you're all staying safe and, uh, and having fun drinking our wines and uh, spending maybe too much time with your kids. <laughs> <laughs> Just like I'm spending too much time with this character yeah, these days, yeah. you know, on camera. <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. And uh, please keep the comments coming. Keep uh, reach out to us. Uh, buy more wine. We'll have to throw that in there at the very end. Buy, buy more wine. Buy more wine. Um, but we will see you next week. And uh, we'll be we'll be having some fun stuff coming out over the next few weeks. All right. It's okay. I think uh, uh, Jessica and Natalie need a drink too. So we're signing off, you guys. <laughs> exactly. And uh, we'll see you next week. Cheers. Cheers.